When Winston Churchill wrote his very famous uh, history after the war, the six-volume history of the Second World War, uh, it was published in America, of course, by the Time Life Corporation in a series and marketed all around the world by them, which meant that when I went to New York and I looked in the, in the papers of the Time Life Corporation, the, the chief, chief editor, a man called Daniel Longwall, all, all his papers are now in the archives of Columbia University in New York, I found there the private correspondence between Churchill and Time Life at the time that he was writing this famous work of history. The Americans had sent editors over to England to Chartwell to sit by, side by side with the grand old Englishman, the greatest living Englishman as we called him, to help him write this book and of course help him steer it in a certain way. Because he was about 70 by then and I must say that I hope that when I'm 70 I'm capable of writing a six volume work as, as big and as important as the one that Churchill wrote. But you can see the Americans gradually shifting the way the book is tilting and Churchill trying to put things in and being prevented from putting it in, not only by the Americans, but also by people around him. In the files of Time Life, for example, is a very illuminating exchange of correspondence between Churchill in 1947 and the German Chancellor Heinrich Brüning, who had been a Chancellor before Hitler. Around about 1928 and 1933, this Chancellor had sat in the highest office in Germany under the president and had watched with great uh, apprehension as the Nazis came to power. And Heinrich Brüning, of course, had known full well who was behind the Nazis and who was financing them during their period in the wilderness. wilderness. Very interesting question. Was it just the brown shirts? Was it the ordinary man in the street, the six million unemployed in Germany? Or who was putting up the money? And Brüning found out who was putting up part of the money to put Hitler into, into office. And in 1937, in fact, on August the 28th, 1937, Bruning wrote to Winston Churchill a letter about it. This was, of course, four or five years after Bruning had been tossed out of office. He'd taken refuge in England, he was in exile in Oxford, and he wrote a private letter to Mr. Churchill, who was also out of office in the wilderness, like himself, explaining to Churchill who had put up the money for Hitler. The sinister men behind the Nazi rise to power. And Churchill wanted to reproduce this letter, this 1937 letter, in his six-volume work of memoirs. And you can look in vain in the me memoirs, volume one or volume two or anywhere else, for that letter, because Bruning asked him after the war not to publish the letter, because it was so embarrassing and so painful. I quote the letter. In fact, Bruning wrote to Churchill in 1947 explaining why he didn't want the letter published. And that's the letter that's in the files of Time Life. He says, I did not and do not even today, for understandable reasons, wish to reveal that from October 1928 the two largest regular contributors to the Nazi party were the general managers of two of the largest Berlin banks. Both of, well, he, he goes on to explain what faith they were of, but I don't want to be accused of anti-Semitism, so I won't say what faith they were, <laughs> these, two, these two people were. One of them was the leader of Zionism in Germany, so writes Bruning in his letter. How embarrassing in 1947 to have to explain that part of the money, a substantial part of the money behind Hitler, mysteriously and inexplicably came from these two Berlin bankers. Why? What was the point of it? We don't know because Churchill bowed the pressure on Bruning. The letter was never published. Bruning, in fact, also reveals that a lot of the money for the Nazis came from French intelligence sources, from certain French arms factories, and uh, that the, the guns that provided, uh, that were used for equipping the SA and the brown shirts and the SS in those early years before the rise to power, largely were provided by Americans, by American arms firms, rather the same as the Americans are providing some of the weapons used by the IRA in Scotland today, in, in Ireland today.